This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 1. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins, and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us so we get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity, the privilege, everything you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by getting a brief look at our outline. As you can see, we're down here towards the bottom in Macedonia and Greece and back to Miletus. That is where this trip will take us. He'll go down to Miletus, talk to the Ephesian elders, and that pretty much ends this lesson. That's entire chapter 20. So we'll be moving right along here. Well, let's begin. If you recall, we ended last with the complaint by Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen over Paul and his team teaching truths that were leading people to turn away from idol worship. This greatly affected their businesses and even the economy of the city. There were many people who were dependent on the worship of Artemis, the fertility god. Well, after a mob in a meeting, then a speech by the city clerk the matter ended when the clerk pointed out that Ephesus had a justice system to be used and they weren't just supposed to railroad people into punishment he also pointed out and this is important that if they did not stop their unruliness then they are the ones who'd be in trouble with Rome well this calmed things down and the assembly of people were dismissed our next section, verses 1 through 16 of chapter 20, is a brief account of an extended ministry. It can be filled in to some extent with some personal references and historical allusions in 2 Corinthians and Romans, which were also written during this period. Chapter 20, verse 1. After the disturbance had ceased, that's the one we just saw back in Ephesus, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. So we are continuing on the third missionary journey. He is moving on up towards Macedonia, up here in the left top part of your map here. He'll be going up there after a few more things are taken care of. Paul's journey would take him to Troas. You can see that just at the center top of the map. From there he goes on over to Macedonia. Now if you remember Macedonia is another Roman province in Greece. It includes some of the cities we've already visited, visited like Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. So he's on his road, he's on the road traveling now, verse two. And when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. As you can see, uh, Luke doesn't give us any detail of where he stopped and for how long, but this trip did take quite a while. So we can suppose he probably stayed at these places, perhaps Philippi and Amphipolis, Thessalonica, Berea. And he moves on down to, well, on the map it's called Achaia, but this whole entire area is Greece, but this is down into southern Greece now. One activity that especially concerned Paul at this time was his need to collect money for relief of the impoverished believers at Jerusalem, <clears throat> because he's going to be going back to Jerusalem soon. He instructed the churches in Galatia 
uh, churches in Asia. That's the big pr uh, province over here, as you see pretty much the third of uh, Asia Minor. Macedonia and down in Achaia about this thing. There's verses on this in the epistles, Romans 15, 25 through 32, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. Well, from Macedonia, he's going to go down into this area down south into Greece. As I said, that's the same as Achaia here. He's going to spend three months there, according to verse 3. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Now, let me get my map back up here. <clears throat> He spends three months here in this area, down in uh, the area of Achaia or Greece. And he wants to go back and set sail for Syria. But he decided to go through Macedonia. Here's what happened. 2 Corinthians 1, 9, 1 through 9, those chapters tell us, this is just an incident for it before we get there. Tells us about Titus a little bit. You don't hear much about Titus, but he too had made a journey to Greece and Corinth, probably with a letter from Paul. Now, the reason I mention this is because most scholars think that there are actually three letters written to the Corinthians. One is extant, that is, it doesn't exist anymore. We haven't got it in the, the Bible, but it's often referred to, sometimes called the Epistle of Tears. Uh, the idea is in 2 Corinthians 2.4. Paul hoped to meet Titus back at Troas. All right, now remember Troas is here on the other side of the Aegean Sea. Titus, however, was delayed, and Paul moved on. And <clears throat> he finally meets Titus in Macedonia, 2 Corinthians 2.12-13. It's not important you know all of this. I just want to mention it. There is some detail of this and other in the epistles. <clears throat> and we hear Titus uh, in the book of Titus, of course, is written due there by Paul. But Titus has news about Corinth, 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11, 7, 5 through 13. Luke never mentions Titus in Acts, but I want to bring him in the story because he is in the story. There are a number of other people in the story too, though we don't see mentioned. Well, anyway, Paul set sail from Palestine for Palestine, Syria. All right, so he's going to want to go back down to the area of Antioch and Palestine over here in the bottom right. All right, there's Jerusalem down here, Antioch up here. So that's the plan. He wanted to reach Jerusalem in time for the festival of Passover. Now, if you recall, we've studied this many times, Passover was held in conjunction with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There was Passover on a Sunday, followed by seven days, ending with the last day. There were seven days of it, of unleavened bread. And he would leave on a pilgrim ship. By that, many would be leaving for Jerusalem about this time for that festival. But there was a plot to kill him at sea. And they found out about this plot, and he decided rather than go by sea, he would go over land. So he's going to go back, he's going to what we call double back, and go back through Macedonia. And while there in Macedonia, and before his final trip on back to Jerusalem, this is probably when Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, as well as his letter to the Romans. The Roman epistle, Romans 15, 17 through 33. Now this travel time of going back and forth like this probably took about a year and a half. In verse 4, Paul lists several of his co-workers. Most all these names are Greeks, so most all these people we expect are Greeks. That is, are Gentiles. Verse 4. And he was accompanied by Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus. And of the Thessalonians, you had Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. 
as you can see sometimes I just copy the names over and transfer them over from the script rather than try to type them all up again that's what I do here and sometimes I have the footnote letters there and that's not intentional that's an oversight but anyway <clears throat> gathered at Corinth for the return journey to Jerusalem with Paul were these representatives from the churches Sopater from Berea let me put the verse back up there Aristarchus Aristarchus rather and Segundus of Thessalonica Gaius of Derby Timothy uh, not mentioned here but he's from Lystra Antichicus and Trophimus from Asia so with the change in travel plans they then accompanied him together with Silas perhaps others into Macedonia Luke may have been there representing Philippi but Paul may have been representing Corinth so there were a lot of churches represented going back to Jerusalem with all this money they had and and if they had a good size a bit of money they'd need this to guard it well <clears throat> Verse 5 mentions what happens to this last group I just mentioned. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. That's a seven mentioned just in verse 4. For us, Paul, and probably Luke, as he says, waiting for us, including Luke there. So this group of seven went on ahead of Paul and Luke and probably others that were with them as well. And they're waiting at Troas. So what we see here is they split into two groups. One group went by sea. The other went with Paul by land. And they were to meet at Troas. And let me show you Troas again. Now they would go by sea in part two. So we see this as Paul going back to Troas. He's back over here now. He goes on to tell the route basically. Uh, let me put the verse back up. But we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. We again would include Luke. The days of unleavened bread, remember that was attached to the back side of the Passover. We're talking about sometime during the months of March to April in that uh, period. Uh, a week basically within that March April period we usually call it around Easter time since Paul was not going to make it back to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover now that things have been delayed and let an unleavened bread they stayed in Philippi to celebrate it and that's what they tell us here where he stayed for seven days he went ahead and stayed in Philippi for seven days well, it took him five days, including uh, some of the time before that, to end up in Troas. Now, usually it only took a couple of days to cross this northern part of the GNC, but uh, commentators seem to think it was because of the winds, troubled waters that took him so long to get back. And that happens sometimes. You don't have the winds with you. It takes a lot longer to get somewhere. Uh, you may have storms. None of that's mentioned. But anyway, it took him long to get back. Uh, earlier it only took them two days, Acts 16, 11. So they end up in Troas, where they stayed for seven days. While in Troas, verse 7. Let me see if I can put this at the bottom. <clears throat> Keep the map up there a little bit. <clears throat> well, that's not going to work. <clears throat> Let's go back to plan A. So on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul spoke to them, intending to depart on the next day. And he, prolong, he prolonged his speech until midnight. So there they were. Uh, Paul's going to speak in Troas. It's the first day of the week. They gathered to break bread. Could mean communion, that they were having communion. That was one of the names for it breaking the bread but also sharing a fellowship meal was called break bread we had break bread mentioned twice here we're not sure they actually got to their first breaking bread before they had an incident well anyway paul spoke to them intending to depart on the next day and prolonged his speech until midnight so he's talking late into the night he spoke 
That is, he reasoned with them. This is that word. They reasoned with them, discussed at length with them, late into the evening. Now, this is an interesting note that Luke, Luke puts in here in verse 8. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. Now, some think that maybe he indicated this to show that there was a perhaps a lack of oxygen. Some say there had been flickering of lights and it would make one sleep. But we're basically talking about a perhaps a teenager here that's going to fall asleep. So that's no surprise. He's probably bored. Uh, don't know for sure, but anyway, he's going to have a problem in the moment. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the window, sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked a while longer. Basically, he talked on and on. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story, and he was taken up dead. When they went and checked on him, he was dead. Now, the term for young man probably means he's somewhere between 8 and 14 years old. Now, the windows were just openings in the wall, basically. Eutychus, just as it reads, was sitting in the window, went to sleep, fell out the window, and plunged three stories to his death. Well, Paul goes outside right, right quick. But Paul went down and threw himself upon him, taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. The translation here says, Threw himself upon him. The reason I did that translation is others might say they picked him up or something, which it could indicate that, but... We have a similar move with both Elijah and Elisha, both in 1st and 2nd Kings. 1st Kings 17, 21, 2nd Kings 4, 34 through 35, where it says here, like it says here, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Paul said to the crowd, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Just a moment here. We don't spend a lot of time on the words in these narratives, but the word for life here is suke, the breath of life. In other words, Paul said his life is in him. Now, this is where things get a little bit, it seems almost out of order. Though not mentioned at this point, Eutychus was restored to life. It probably happened the moment Paul made this statement, his life is in him. He came back alive. Verse 11, because now we have Paul going right back upstairs. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a little while until daybreak and so departed. So this tells us that after <clears throat> Eutychus came back to life, Paul went back upstairs, talked a little longer, daybreak, says they broke bread. Now, this was just the first broken bread they never got to. But notice it says, and eaten. So this probably refers to a fellowship meal, uh, some sort of perhaps midnight snack. So indications are they could have had both a communion meal earlier. Now they have a midnight snack, what we would call a fellowship meal in those days. And then we have this almost insertion here in verse 12, and it says, and they took the youth away alive and were greatly comforted. That seems like it's out of order, doesn't it? But I think this may be Luke's way of saying um, that the boy was fine. He doesn't leave a loose end here for us. Uh, he was alive and they were greatly comforted. So he's back to normal. Let me just point out a few things here. We're moving pretty fast, I know that, but this is narrative. We don't have a lot to comment on here, just a few clarifications. But I do want to point out a few things here. These people who gathered at Troas with Paul were hungry for the truth. Paul obliged. He taught all night. I remember as a young man staying up late talking about the Word of God. There was hardly anything more exciting in life. We'd go to Bible study and they'd come home, or not go home, but go out and eat or go out and have some coffee, and we'd talk about it and talk about it and other things. So from what we've seen, they may have had both a communion and fellowship meal as well as all-night Bible study. 
And then they had this boy fall out of the window, and they got to witness the presence and power of God in that miracle, watching him be raised from the dead. God's power was present with Paul. From here, Paul is going to Miletus. If you look at the map here, we have Miletus right down here. Notice how the ship comes around. We come down to Miletus, right down here, right below Ephesus. So, the story continues, verse 13, 13 through 38. So this is basically going to cover the rest of the book, rest of the chapter, excuse me. All right, here, I'll go ahead and read that first. We went on ahead to the ship and put out to sea for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. Now, here's what happens here is Paul went ahead and made arrangements for his companions to take the ship he would go by land. So let's look at the map. So here's Assos. There, uh, he went on ahead to the ship and put out to sea for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. So Paul and them are all going to meet in Miletus soon. Uh, Paul's companions took passage on a coastal vessel. That was to stop at various ports along the western coast of Asia Minor. They first thought Paul was going to go with them. All right, they're heading from uh, Troas down to Assos. All right, eventually they're going to get to Miletus. All right, a little tricky to follow here, the wording. So Paul's companions took passage on this coastal vessel that stopped at these various ports. Paul goes by land. Now this may be, again, he was aware of something that was going on on the ship. We're not told. Paul would walk to Assos. Verse 14. He's going he's gonna to go there to Assos first. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. All right? Sometimes I pronounce it differently. Now let's look at these two towns for a moment as we look at the map. Here's Assos, a city of Mysia. You can see Mysia is one of the regions there, smaller regions. It's 24 miles southeast of Troas. It was a Roman coastal road that he took faced south toward the island of Lesbos. Yes, that's where we get the name Lesbian if that's of any interest. The boat from there went on to Mytilene, all right, further south. Now, Mytilene was the most important city on the island of Lesbos in the Aegean Sea. It was about 44 miles from Assos. It was a splendid port on the southeast coast of Lesbos and the chief city of this largest of the islands of Western Asia Minor. You can see how large it is compared to other islands. Where they're going to leave from there, let's go back to our text. Sailing from there, we arrived the following day offshore from Chios. The next day, we crossed over to Samos, and the next and the day after that, we went to Miletus. Well, here we go. Remember, I said they take these coastal vessels; they go along the coast probably loading and unloading freight. You can see Chios right here, an island in the Aegean Sea. Uh, it was the major city in this same island by the same name of Chios. Now Samos, you can see south of it. All right. Actually, Samos is, uh, you can see it's more east of Chios. So they'd stop there too. It's an island in the Aegean Sea off the western coast of Asia Minor. So they went offshore from Chios. The next day we crossed over to Samos. And the day after that we went down to Miletus. Now this is their 
goal at this point. Get to Miletus. Don't confuse that with my Tulane earlier. All right. So they've had all they've hit all these places in a well could have took them several weeks. By the way, Kios mentioned that a moment ago. That was the birthplace of Homer. Samos was the birthplace of Pythagoras. For those who have interest in the Greeks. So it was typical of ships like this to go from port to port, spend the day, as I said, probably loading and unloading freight, perhaps passengers as well. Well, Paul has something in mind that might surprise some of his passengers. Verse 16, For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so that he might not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hurrying to arrive in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now remember, it was just a short time ago we had the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover, so we're within uh, maybe four to five weeks before Pentecost. And Paul wants to get back before that starts. Another celebration, another major pilgrimage. There was... Uh, three major pilgrim festivals of Judaism, uh, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Verse 17, in Miletus, Paul's going to give a farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. That's going to last from chapter 20, verse 17 through 38. So we start our next major section here at the end of the chapter. Now a few things we should see in this speech before we get into the heart of it. They are similar to his epistles in both context, I should say, excuse me, not context, but content and structure. He's going to see some of these people for the last time, at least he thinks he is. He talks to them like it's going to be the last time. And I suppose it will be for some of them. However, he does not leave them with what they need to continue on as Christians and as a church. Now, as we look at this speech, we'll see that it has a clear structure. He'll address one topic after another. And I will point that out as we proceed. But again, like I said, it's sort of like the pattern or the, the structure of his epistles to these churches like the Ephesians. Verse 17 and 18 gives us the setting. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus a message and called the elders of the church to come to him. Now that's an insertion. It just says call the elders of the church, but we know there would have been a message. They want him to come there because they do. The travel time would take two to four days depending on how long it would take all the elders to get down there. Might have taken extra time. It's basically a one-day travel trip, one day down, one day back. So at any rate, they get down there. And we see the word elders mentioned. Let's just talk about this for a moment. Well, we've talked about elders many times before. The synagogue had them. The church had them. Basically, they're older, wiser men, and they should be mature believers. In this case, in the Christian church, it would be men who are also leaders of that church body. That is, back in Ephesus. So, to say that they had elders shows us that Paul had not left the church without leaders. In verse 18, Paul begins to make a defense of himself. He'll do this night, now and then, especially when he comes into a church or writes a letter, because often he's under attack. Many churches attacked him for a variety of reasons. It may surprise you, but if you read the epistles, he often had to go into defense. Well, not any different here. And when they came to him, he said to them, here's how he starts, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Now, when he talks about living among them, He's not talking about just being personally present there. He's talking about his way of life. So he's starting to review his faithfulness in ministry and his example before them. That's what this refers to. Know how I lived among you. He 
He's referring to his lifestyle. So he appeals to their knowledge of him. These people knew how Paul lived among them. He knew he was dedicated to his teaching and his ministry, that he showed tremendous love for the people and the sacrifice he did for them, uh, often even working so they wouldn't have to support him. But that depends on the situation. So they know his way of life since he came into Asia. Verse 19 goes on to describe serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. Oh, here we go, those Jews again. Again, this is the religious Judaizers who insisted on not only following the Mosaic Law, but all the attachments they had to it. They really believed if you're serious about God, you're going to be into Judaism. Keeps going off and on, doesn't it? Here we go. Let's talk about the word trials for a moment. Trial sums up the many persecutions he went through. Uh, there were many. The religious Jews had many plots to get rid of Paul. We've seen that off and on throughout the book of Acts. And they basically wanted to make his life miserable, make it hard for his ministry. And there are some people who like to do that, by the way, especially if you're teaching truth. You're not doing it the way they want you to or not teaching what they want you to. They will try their best to shut you down or just go on the attack of you as a person. Notice also he served the Lord with all humility. Uh, he didn't show arrogance. He didn't act like he knew it all. Didn't act like he was better than all them. He didn't do any of that. He was humble before the Lord. He was there to serve the Lord. Now sometimes when you're there just to serve the Lord, a lot of people think they ought to get more attention than they should. And Paul wouldn't need to give it. He wouldn't give it. He just did his duty, you might say, responsibility to God. Notice with tears, he cared so much for these people. He often uh, taught them and uh, comfort them with tears. Uh, people hurt in churches for a number of reasons. Loss of a loved one, spiritual struggles, loss of something else, maybe their health or something, financial issues. So he had his hands full in this church. Tears, trials, still remained humble. At the same time he had to do, he had to deal with the plots that were out to get him. By these Jews. But in doing so, verse 20, the sentence continues, while he's doing these things we just mentioned, how I did not hold from declaring to you anything that was profitable. In other words, he didn't hold anything back that they needed to hear. And teaching you publicly and from house to house. Paul taught them what was profitable, what was a benefit. And he did this in both in public, that would include their assemblies, and their homes, where they would have their church meetings at times. So there was no limit on where he might preach or teach the Word of God. It was not just no limit on where he'd do it, but to whom he did it. Verse 21 testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason I have Christ in brackets here is because some of the manuscripts leave out Christ. It's just sometimes inserted by scribes and they think that fits better or maybe someone else left it out so they're going to fill it in, kind of do everybody a favor. But uh, some manuscripts omit it and that's why you have this uh, brackets around it. This truth of testifying about repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is foundational to everything. Without repentance and faith, there is no beginning to a Christian life. In fact, if it doesn't continue in your life, there's no Christian life. Now, this is in great contrast to the Judaizers who insisted and following their system of belief. 
that system of belief that hid and distorted the truth of God's word. They insisted that full acceptance with God could only come through a fully developed Judaism in each person's life. And at the end here, Paul reminds him of the basic things, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just sum up these last three verses with some points. I'm actually just going to state it. I'm not going to put it in points. Paul's ministry was characterized by faithfulness, teaching what was necessary and profitable and that message went to all Jew and Gentile both in public and in private that's what he did he taught he taught he taught and in our weeks of doing this study we've seen the response various degrees some very responsive to those very opposed some inviting them to his home some trying to kill him it's quite a spectrum isn't it well the second section of Paul's address to these elders concerns his plans to go to Jerusalem that's the next three or four verses verses 22 through 25 verse 22 reads and now behold I'm going to Jerusalem bound by the Spirit not knowing what will happen to me there now let's look at this word bound it's an important word here in our passage the word for bound here perfect passive participle uh, the idea is to, con to constrain with a chain, deo, or bind, or bound. The perfect tells us that it's this way. It tells us that it's been this way. The Spirit has so bound him that he knows he must go to Jerusalem. So the metaphor means here that he's under obligation to go to Jerusalem. There's no question that Paul was being directed by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And then he has this interesting admission at the end. Notice, last phrase in our verse, not knowing what will happen to me there. What will happen to Paul is unknown, except for a warning. And that comes in verse 23. A warning, verse 23. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city, saying that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So here's a couple of things I want you to understand Paul is saying. The Holy Spirit is directing me to go to Jerusalem. I'm bound to go there. In other words, he's, it's like the Holy Spirit is saying, I've got you, you're going. That was what his motive was is to follow God's will and for him to get to Jerusalem because that is what the Spirit's telling him to do. That's what this means. At the same time we learn that the Spirit's already told him, continues to tell him you could say, that he's going to continue to have troubles, imprisonment, afflictions. So that's not going to be any surprise. That's been going on since the beginning a large part of his ministry. His, his journeys anyway. Imprisonment and afflictions are all part of God's plan for Paul. Now he will hear about these imprisonments and warnings from others, prophets, perhaps some prophets now and then. They'll warn him of problems at Jerusalem, but that doesn't stop him. He already knew that was part of the plan because he'd gotten that from the Spirit. So that's nothing new. It's just that when he hears it again, maybe right before he goes there, it probably got his attention. Oh, yeah. What am I going to get in Jerusalem? But listen to his response. Verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any value 
nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Well, that's quite a mouthful. Let's break it down a little bit. Here's his response to what's going to happen. He's bound to go to Jerusalem with the Spirit, continuous imprisonment and afflictions. But I do not consider my life of any value, of any worth, as precious to myself. In other words, it's not that important to me. I can give it up. Paul does not see his life as all that valuable or precious to himself or of any worth to him. Now, it doesn't mean he's going to throw it away. But he knows if God wants him to spend it in ministry, he's willing to do it. No problem. If he has to lose it for the gospel, fine. His goal in life is twofold, as the next two phrases say. If only I may finish my course. Notice this. If only I may finish, that's the purpose. In order to finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. More than anything else in life, he wants to finish his ministry that the Lord Jesus gave him. And that includes the second goal, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now listen, Paul did not mind when his life ran out, or even how it ran out as he stayed on mission. As long as he stayed on mission, as long as he kept doing what God wanted him to do, and this puts sufferings, trials, rejection, and perspective. It's all part of God's plan for him in his ministry. Once you start a serious ministry, and I'm not saying it has to be in teaching, whatever it is, you will find yourself opposed. They won't like what you're doing or the way you're doing it. Something wrong with you, wrong with what you're doing. You'll find yourself short supply. You'll find yourself not where you want to be. And there'll be a lot of challenges. But you look at it from the standpoint of you're running a race. You're running a course. They might say it's an obstacle course with many challenges. God had given Paul a course to run. Paul knew that well, so that all he wanted to do is run that course well, and if he died at the finish line, it couldn't turn out any better for him. Now, having said this, Paul does not know how this will all end. He's only got a glimpse that he's going to go to Jerusalem. Now, in the third section of this address, Paul began by speaking of his future expectations after visiting Jerusalem. Now, here's kind of what he expects. Verse 25. And now I know, behold, I want to get your attention, listen up. I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Paul does not anticipate seeing any of these elders again. Does this mean he may not come by Ephesus again? Most likely. He goes on, verse 26. In fact, 27, both of these verses declare, he declares is innocent of any guilt since he's carried out his responsibilities. That sums up these two coming verses. He declares his innocence of any guilt since he has carried out his responsibilities. Verse 26. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. This is a way of saying that he has fulfilled his responsibility to them completely. He is no longer obligated to these people. He's done what he's supposed to do for them, and he's done doing it. He pointed them in the right direction, gave them a foundation for their faith, 
handed them off to worthy overseers. The rest was up to them. Now he's talking to the overseers now. But it's up to them, and they can always relay the message Paul's telling them now. They were to make wise choices, of which he had taught them to make. Now, you can teach people to make wise choices all the time, but they might not make them. That's another thing. Those of you who have children know what I'm talking about, but it's similar in the ministry, too. You'll tell people what they should do. You're not directing it to them personally. Maybe if they ask for it, you might, but normally it's in generally uh, speaking to an audience or something along that line of Bible study. And you give people direction what to do. They might not take that direction. That's really up to them. But you do what you're supposed to do. You gave them the right guidance. You warned them if you needed to, as we'll see here, even in this section. But the rest is up to them. Now, what Paul is saying is he did not leave these people unprepared to carry on. Look at verse 27. This is part of that. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God counsel of God is God's will, God's plan. Paul had covered all the issues they needed to hear that he had to offer them. As a church, they have the spiritual gifts of the members. They have their pastors, their teachers. They could carry on by themselves now. Doesn't mean they're not going to get more information. Of course they will. As a, for example, the letters get passed around the epistles from church to church that are written by both Paul and other apostles, which you assume they eventually got. And verses 28 through 31 begins an exhortation to these elders to care for the flock, including a warning. Now, this is a very practical piece of text here for anyone who wants to be a pastor or an overseer, an elder, basically the same thing. Verse 28. Watch out for yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own. Now listen carefully. There's a twofold, twofold warning here to these elders. Watch out for yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you, that's basically saying the Holy Spirit was involved in them becoming the elders or the overseers. Sometimes it happened by appointment from an apostle or a prophet that they had in their audience who passed through and says, this man should be one of your leaders. All right? So these people, the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. Let's get back to our verse here. Let me read this entire verse. Watch out for yourselves and do all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own. I hadn't read that, have I? Okay, now there you have it. A twofold warning. Watch out for yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That is, they're in charge of the oversight, the supervision, the care of the flock. Then their responsibility to shepherd the church of God. To shepherd, drawn from the analogy of a shepherd and sheep, to care for, feed, protect, lead, guide, those type of things. Then notice the next line that he obtained with the blood of his own. Of course, that would be Jesus Christ. The blood of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. This is an explicit statement referring to the substitutionary nature of Christ's death. He died for the flock. He died for believers. Elders, he paid the price for the spiritual life of those who you're in charge of. It was the highest price that could have been paid for Christ's church. Christ's own blood. They were to take their shepherding responsibilities very seriously. And by the way, it also indicates they're owned by God. They're God's people. 
Here's the warning, verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Fierce wolves portrays graphically the violence a wolf does in attacking a sheep. They basically just tear it apart. So false teachers attack the flock of believers, destroying their spiritual life, not sparing the flock. They're out to get the flock. False teachers are like that. Now, false teachers often act in ignorance. They don't know the damage they're doing. But the devil does. Uh, uh, false teachers are aware of what they're doing, know what they're doing, to spread the false stuff, to get believers mixed up, to get them neutralized so they won't be effective and, uh, as far as a witness goes. It goes on, the warning does. Now listen to this. And from your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Notice, and from among your own selves will arise men. These false teachers would rise among perhaps some of the elders there. Some of the congregation. It could be either. They speak twisted things. The word means pervert, pervert, perversions, perversions of the truth. One of the great methods of false teachers is to be subtle and twist the truth, causing it to be slightly off so that the sheep stumbles, falls when he hears it, or knock him a little off course. And then gradually, as time goes on, he goes further and further away as he steered away from the truth. Sometimes all you need to do is just put in a few principles that are false, mix them with truth, and they won't fully understand that truth or they'll misapply it. False teachers draw off disciples to themselves. You notice the last line, to draw away the disciples after them. So they'll follow them in their perverted teaching. Verse 31. More strong terms. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Remember the time they spent, Paul spent back in Ephesus? Night and day teaching these people, all hours of the night, all hours of the day. The warning here is to be alert, to watch. Later, both the epistles to Timothy speak of a revolt against Paul and apostasy. Incredible as it seems. 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20, 4, 1 through 5, 2 Timothy 1, 15, 2, 17 through 18, 3, 1 through 9, and if you recall, if you study Revelation, in Revelation 2, 1 through 7, says that the Ephesian church abandoned its first love. Now, Ephesus does great for a long time, especially when you get into the epistle. They're one of the more mature congregations, but they go off track. The time you get to Revelation, they've abandoned their first love. That is, the epistle to the Ephesians that John writes in Revelation. Verses 32 through 35 commends them to God's grace and warns them about not taking advantage of the people. This is 32 through 35. Paul writes, And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. To commend someone is to entrust someone to the care and protection of someone else. In this case, it's the God's care and protect, protection. Notice who he commends these men to, which in turn would include the church. He commends you to God and to the message of his grace. Paul tells these Ephesian elders that he is handing them over to God for his care and protection and the message of his grace. Now, even though Paul must leave them, they have his word and God is with them. 
This was to continue to build them up. Which is able to build you up to give you the inheritance. The salvation package. Among all those who are sanctified. Other believers who have been set apart to God. Notice some of the key terms. We see these in books like Ephesians. Build up, inheritance, sanctified. Verse 33, Paul again points to his faithfulness. We'll get to this a short verse. I coveted no one silver or gold or peril. <laughs> you don't see that too often, apparel. I don't want your clothes. Don't want your wardrobe. The word coveted here. Let's look at that. I haven't looked at many words here in detail, but epithumeo, to long for, to strongly desire. So he wasn't into getting their stuff or their material goods. Verse 34, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. When Paul was with some of these people, especially in places like Ephesus and Corinth, he worked. He worked and supported himself. Now other places he got support. Uh, he, he, supported him, he supported himself in Corinth and even in Thessalonica and Ephesus. Some scripture, Acts 18, I believe it was 21 through 31. Actually, a correction here. That's Acts 18, 2 through 3. 1 Corinthians 4, 12, 9, 12. 2 Corinthians 11, 7. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. There were times Paul supported himself. point Paul's trying to make is elders should be thinking in terms of service and not material reward. That's the only way to do it by the way. Serve, serve, serve. Let God take care of you. And if you find yourself having to work, you work. Part time, you work. If you get enough support not to work, then you don't have to do a job on the side. You spend more time in ministry. It's a rare thing to get so su much support that you can take care of your uh, needs without having to get some sort of job on the side. It's been a long time since I've had that. Still don't, but that's okay. That's okay. And verses 35 through 38, let me see if I can get that all up there. 35 through 38 concludes the scene with prayer and tears, and he boards the ship to depart. That's what I'm trying to put up here. He aboards the ship to depart. Verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, the weak here, also the sick. And then this phrase at the end that says, And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Do you know that's not in the Gospels? So we have to say that Jesus said that at some other time, that either through oral tradition, still inspired, but we don't have any record of him, a uh, written record of him saying that, though we see the implication in other similar verses. So Paul must have had another source. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. By the way, blessed here means happiness. Happiness comes from giving to others in need. Sometimes an emotional uplift, of course, but it's also a deep satisfaction when you know you can give to people, and you do, and it was God's will. Now, Paul has just told us something of his example. At the same time, he adds what Jesus had said. Their attitude in ministry is to give themselves first. That's what you do. 
Nothing better you can do as a Christian than to serve God wholeheartedly. Verse 36, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Indicates here the solemnity of the moment. They're all kneeling now. He's going to pray with them before he leaves, before they go back to Ephesus. Verse 37, well, it doesn't stop there. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him. You can just see it's a very emotional departure. It says they kissed him. That was both a, a sign of affection and farewell. Um, in those days, it was under these circumstances and according to custom that this type of thing was acceptable. So they were weeping. They were sad they wouldn't see Paul again. That's what he just told them. He didn't plan on seeing them again. Being sorrowful, most of all because of the word he had spoken. That's why they're kissing him and they're weeping. That they would not see his face again and they accompanied him to the ship. So after this emotional goodbye, they take him down to the ship. Let's look at a few key teachings here. I'll just give a summary. I'll put them up on the board. Paul prepared believers through teaching them the word of God and seeing that leaders over them both understood and carried out their responsibilities. You see that come out in these last few verses. Believers were to grow in the word and develop discernment. Paul taught the whole council, that is, the, the will of God, the plan of God. He taught them valuable truths that, that would both benefit and protect them from false teachers. The overseer slash elders were to care for, protect, feed the flock as given in the pastoral epistles also. Uh, the pastoral epistles talk about this a great deal. Their elder overseers were to be careful of those who might twist the truth to gain their own following. They were to protect, they were to protect them from any subverting of the gospel. Finally, one of the great motives for continual and faithful service is for the shepherd to keep in mind those whom he teaches and cares for are owned by God, paid for by the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. Well, let's close by reading through the translation. Chapter 20, here we go. After the disturbance had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopater, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul spoke to them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the window, sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked a while longer, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and threw himself upon him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a little while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were greatly comforted. We went ahead 
on ahead to the ship and put out to sea for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there. For so he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Matilan. Sailing from there, we arrived the following day offshore from Chios. The next day we crossed over to Samos, and the day after that we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to arrive in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus a message and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not hold from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, bound by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit, Spirit testifies to me in every city, saying that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, Watch out for yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the flock of God that he obtained with the blood of his own. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these, these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that my, by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken. They would not see his face again and they accompanied him to the ship. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word. It's been challenging. There's a lot of material here, a lot of important lessons. May we, in the power of the Holy Spirit, not only believe and learn these things, but apply them properly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.